Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's Career Pacino. Hopefully you're armed with a cup of coffee or tea, possibly, um, ready for a 20-minute boost on um, all things postdoc. And today we are looking at the thorny topic of I'm a postdoc, get me out of here. Um, so this is something that I hear um, obviously quite a lot. I've worked with postdocs now for oh, probably over 20 years. And before that, guess what I was? A postdoc myself. So I've certainly been there, done that and come up with the escape plan. So what I'm going to take us through over the next 20 minutes are just some tips for how to get out of your postdoc proactively and positively. So not running away screaming, but looking towards whatever might happen next in a very positive light. So you are all, if I haven't, no one's told you this morning, um, amazing project managers, problem solvers, you're highly literate, highly numerate. You've got all sorts of transferable skills that the world is absolutely desperate for. And it is about taking those out into the wider world. Um, any questions as we go along, just pop them into the chat. I've just pulled up the chat in front of me so that I can see that if you need it. Okay. So the first thing that I'm going to say, and this is true of any career decision, um, but people don't stop and think about it often enough. Um, we kind of keep going on autopilot. And what you need to do is really stop and think, OK, you've made the decision that probably a postdoc or perhaps an academic career isn't for you. Um, so thinking, OK, what's next? And rather than go, oh, I must find a job and head over to the jobs pages, it's like stop and think, OK, you've reached this decision for a reason. And even if you haven't reached the decision, but it's a little nagging voice in your brain, um, what you know what's what's driving that there must be something that you don't like about the current situation or that you think the the career progression isn't great or that it's you know so competitive to get an academic permanent position and you'd like a permanent job and lots of different reasons that people would like to move on so thinking about stopping and really taking stock of who you are and what is important to you is a very firm bedrock before you go on to do anything else. So I'm going to encourage you to look at your values and your strengths. So your values are those things which you hold dear. Um, for me, the, the, I think autonomy is a really important one. So being able to do um, what I want to do, obviously with others and in partnership with my clients or whoever they might be. but it to be able to have some choice in the work that I do. You're all super educated, lots and lots of skills. You should be able to have, um, choose a role that gives you um, some choice over your destiny. But thinking other values might be important. So there are some listed on here. Uh, there's things like um, excellence, uh, being able to take the lead, um, working in something that you feel is sort of ethically matched to, to your value set, um, allowing you to progress. And for the majority of you, I imagine there must be an element in whatever we choose next of being able to use your brain because you've got those fantastic brains. Um, and so thinking, how can I use that? So there will be some sort of intellectual satisfaction in the mix, I think. Uh, when it comes to articulating values, I find they're a bit fuzzy. They're a bit hard to get grab hold of. So one of the things you can do is um, talk it through with someone. So you can get lists of values on the internet. Um, there are lots of different lists. Uh, and you can try and sort of winnow it down. There will be some that you think, oh, that really doesn't apply. But you'll probably end up with a very long shortlist. The best way to then articulate that is to chat it through with someone. 
for them to ask, why is that important to you? Is this one more important than that? Because you're not going to be able to find the perfect job that ticks everything. Uh, but if you can find the one that does tick those that are really key to you, then that will help. The other thing to think about are your strengths. So you are good at a lot of things, but your strengths are the things that you really enjoy doing that make you feel strong. So I don't know whether yoga is one of your strengths here, but it's something to think about that something that really makes you feel feel alive, I suppose. Um, so I'm good at numbers, like ex-physicists, you would expect me to be good at numbers and good at um, organising stuff because that's what I've done through experiments. But that doesn't really thrill me. Yes, I can do it. But if I had a day of accounts or even just numbers for different courses and things, it really wouldn't thrill me um, with, you know, joy. Whereas if you gave me a day being creative, and coming up with problem-solving stuff, absolutely. You know, I'd be up early at my desk. I'd probably be at my desk before my first cup of coffee. Um, so thinking, you know, kind of what makes you feel strong? Um, you've got lots and lots of skills, but a strength is what makes you feel strong. Okay. Um, for those of you who came in a little bit late, you can always ask a question in the chat. So don't be afraid. Having worked with a lot of postdocs over the years, I dread to think how many, lots, um, we do tend to think, okay, if I can't be a postdoc, then I'm going to be a teacher or I'm going to be an industrial scientist. And we, we don't look at the things in between. We don't look at the other options. So my first thought, even if you think, if you have a very strong idea of what you're going for, use this opportunity to <laughs> go out and think about what you could do. So you've had that unsettling feeling that perhaps this isn't for you. You've thought about your values and your strengths. Now go and look at the range of things that could give you those things in the world of work. We spend a long time at work. Um, so it's got to be um, enjoyable. It's got to fulfill um, those values and letters that play to our strengths. And sometimes I, I find that postdocs are very narrow focused and they don't look at all the options. And there are plenty of roles out there that perhaps could give you that. So you might be looking at, I don't know, um, working in a drugs company as an R&D scientist, because that's very similar to what you're doing now. You're an R&D scientist in a university, so I'll go and do the same thing. But other options, I'm trying to think, uh, medical writing, that uses some of the skills that you've had in there, working in a policy department on public health, um, again, it's linked, it's, it's built on your skills. Now, some of these ideas you might think, ooh, that's fine. <laughs> I'm not, I'm just putting them out there. But I want you to encourage to look broadly. And the best way that you can do that is to just open up the job website of your choice. Um, if you're in the UK, I think the Guardian Jobs website is really nice. Um, and open it up and just see what jobs are out there. Now you could narrow it down to science and technology if you wanted to, if that was your background. If you are blissfully a researcher from another um, type of discipline, look broadly. Don't just look at the categories that you would gravitate towards, okay? Look at everything that's on offer. Now initially, some of those things will be definite no's, but my idea is that if you don't understand a job title, that could be your ideal job hiding behind a, a, an obscure job title. So do click in, find out what that means, and then you'll know. And you'll know whether it's a yes or a no or a possible. But do 
open it out. This is an ideal opportunity to do that. Um, careers are not the same as they were when my parents were growing up, where you chose one thing and you stayed in it for 50, 60 years and then you stopped. Um, the, we are much more um, portfolio careers. I am on, I don't know, career number three. Um, but who knows? I might go and run a coffee shop. You know what? That's a very attractive idea. Um, next. I don't know. Anyway. Do look at your options. You've got a lot more options than you think. Um, and I, I, we, t we tend to go from one thing to the other. And it's, you know, kind of, okay, I'm going to look a little bit this way. And then I'm going to go forward rather than looking at the wealth of options that you've got. Okay. Once we've sort of started to think, right, this is where I want to go. These are, these are some job uh, jobs that I'm interested in. So when you've started thinking, right, this is what I want, you ideally want the jobs to come into your inbox. So that broad search initially is going to involve looking at jobs websites, LinkedIn, professional websites, company websites. It's going to be very broad. But it is a job to get a job. So you want the information to come in. So once you've decided on a route, is making sure that you've honed those search skills and that they are delivering in your inbox. So every day you have a little digest of jobs coming in. It is a job to get a job, so you need to dedicate time to it. Okay, you, It's not going to happen overnight. Absolutely not. So let's make sure that we've got those jobs coming in. Other things that we need to consider are, are outward-facing activities. So do you have a personal website? You might have one linked to your research. Um, is that up to date? Is that what I want to be telling people at this point? Um, if you have LinkedIn, and I strongly, strongly recommend that you have LinkedIn, and I've written blogs and um, written for the Times Higher on that. I think it's so important when you're looking for a job. You can't afford not to have it. But that's a separate webinar. Um, making sure your LinkedIn is up to date. Uh, making sure that um, your CV, you're going to tailor your CV to a specific job. You absolutely must do that. But making sure that you've got all the information that might go on that CV to hand. So your master document is up to date. So have you got the details of your last bit of employment? The number of CVs I see from postdocs where it's just got their PhD and it stopped. I was like, well, what have you been doing for the past three years? Um, so making sure that everything is up to date, which is why I'm saying get your ducks in a row. Right, English phrase, but we need all these things ready so that when a job comes in and we go, yes, we're ready to go um, because, you know, the, the way the world works, we've usually only got a few days to put that application together. The other reason for having that outward facing stuff ready is that hopefully you are telling your network, I'm interested in jobs in medical writing, in government policy, um, so you've, you've announced it to your network and your network is now, um, they're not actively seeking roles for you, <laughs> unfortunately. But if something comes across their radar, absolutely, they'll go, oh, Emma might like this. I'll send it to her. So you want to be telling people, and this is another one of these ducks, what it is that you would like to do next. And going and finding out more information. Oops. So information is absolutely key. Uh, one of my favourite phrases that I use a lot is, do you think that or do you know that? And quite often we go, oh, I can't be, I can go into policy because, um, you know, kind of thing, they need people who've written books in the past. No, that's a myth. 
Uh, I couldn't go into medical writing because I've only written scientific papers. I haven't written anything for a newspaper. Okay, another myth. Um, I couldn't run a coffee shop because I don't like coffee. That could be a problem. That's probably not a myth. But thinking about information, you've got facts and figures and you've got your job descriptions. Those are things you can, you know, go and read and collect and understand. Um, you can also look at, you know, how many people work in those different industries, how big the companies are, how many companies there are, how many job adverts there are. So you can get all those facts and figures. Very helpful. But what is even more helpful is the inside skinny on any particular job. You absolutely must have this. So what you can do here is, again, I'm going to say use LinkedIn or your network. Find someone you know who works in that role. Now, because you are considering that role means that you've got certain skill set. Chances are that the people you know have come from similar backgrounds, have similar skill sets. Chances are they or their network know someone who has those skills and has that type of job. You need to ask those people very politely for a quick 15-minute video or phone call, much better than an email chain, um, to just say, look, I'm interested in moving from my postdoc into insert industry here. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about what it's like day to day. You are definitely not asking for a job, which makes it a bit easier. You are asking for information. Those conversations are hugely powerful. If you have a conversation and then you go, oh, that's not at all what I thought medical writing or nuclear physics or whatever it might be. That's not at all what I thought it would be like day to day. I'm, I'm impressed. I'm quite excited. This sounds like my sort of thing. Or you have the, oh, that really isn't for me. And actually closing a door at this point, because I've told you to open all the doors, closing a door is a good thing. So you need that information. You need that personal information. The other thing that happens when you go out and you ask for information is that they are then another part of your network that are going, ah, oh, John, he talked to me about this the other day. I wonder if he's interested that we're hiring now. So they might not, you know, offer you a job on the spot. But again, it's that awareness. So I have a, a friend who always says, put it out to the universe. You know what? That's a bit woo-woo for me. But if you tell people, what you're hoping to do, most people will then think, okay, I'm going to help them out. If, I, if something comes across my radar, I'll send it to John. I'll send it to Jane. I'll make sure they've got it. So information is key. And it is literally as simple as having a cup of coffee um, with someone virtual or otherwise. And the, the one silver lining from the pandemic is that we're all very good at talking um, virtually now so you could talk to someone and find out what it was like to work in Canada doing nuclear physics in a power plant very easily in a way that perhaps would have been much harder 10 years ago or would have involved probably you know a very dodgy Skype call or something like that so information is key okay so that was a whistle stop tour. I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. Um, if you have a question, pop it in the chat while you are typing. Um, ways that I can help you um, are that I could look at your CV or an application. Absolutely can work on those and hone them up. And that's for you know, a variety of jobs. I've seen all sorts of jobs over the years. Um, or if you've been um successful with that and you've got called to interview then i can run a mock a dummy interview with you um which you know practice is really good because the other thing that i find is that postdocs haven't had a lot of in interview practice you know you might have had an interview for your postdoc but that might have been a couple of years ago and then one for your phd and that was four years before that 
So we tend not to have a lot of interview experience, so I can help you with that. If there are no questions, then I will leave it a minute. Uh, can I wish you a very, very productive week? Um, and tune in next time. Next week is an Ask Me Anything. So do um, think about your questions. Come back next week ready to ask them. It, well, anything related to being a postdoc. Let's put it that way. I'm not going to give you cookery advice. Um, but um, you are all very welcome to come to that and um, do let your other researcher friends know if they've got a burning question. Okay, it doesn't look like there are any qu any questions this morning, so I will love you and leave you. Have oh, I know I've got a Q and A here. Sorry, different box. So I want to look for jobs without letting my actual supervisor know that I'm doing it. Would it so would it be possible to use LinkedIn with outsourcing? So absolutely, anonymous attendee, um, <laughs> it would. So your LinkedIn profile. Firstly, I very much doubt your PI is watching, your principal investigator is watching your LinkedIn profile. They're, they're really not, you know, kind of, they're busy people. Um, the other thing that you can do is make sure that you've written your LinkedIn profile with a view to future employers. So you don't have to write looking for work in your headline, but you could write, I don't know, a molecular biologist with a passion for healthcare. She said, just make it, making sure that's in your headline so that your, your profile already looks outward facing. Your about section has the things that potential employers are going to be looking for. Okay. It is very common um, for people not to want to tell their boss that they're thinking of moving on for obvious reasons. It just makes it a bit awkward. Um, so, Again, you can do that very naturally. Having a LinkedIn profile, most people have one, whether it's active or not. But just, you know, you can step up your presence on the site. You can follow companies, et cetera, et cetera. Your PR is not going to know any of that. They're not going to delve into what you're doing on LinkedIn. Um, so I think you can absolutely do that on LinkedIn, but don't... Never, ever, even if you are looking for work and you're unemployed, say looking for work because it just makes you look desperate. OK, so just put the type of um, researcher you are with the interest which applies to the industry that you're thinking of um, um, applying to. Hopefully that helps anonymous attendee. Good question.